Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Old Men Wearing Flannel again. That's right. It's a chilly morning here in Richmond, Virginia, so I thought I'd put some flannel on and, like most old men, try to stay warm. So uh, I know you're all craving to see the moose again. He'll put in an appearance shortly. But it reminds me of a joke I read on the Internet this morning, which is a dad joke, and that is, what do you call a moose with no name? A not a moose. How about that? That's pretty cool, at least for a dad joke anyway. All right, this week's research review is going to focus on just a couple of papers uh, that I thought were of significance. There's a lot more research that's over in the thumbnail sketch that you can have a look at. As always, I don't review animal research or publish dissertations or doctoral theses or trade media articles. In this case, we just want to look at articles published in journals. Up first is, I think, a very exciting development in the area of medical management of ADHD, specifically in adults. And that is a trial of a medication that's been around for a while and used to treat daytime sleepiness in people. Uh, the drug is called Sinocell. Uh, but in this case, the actual chemical name for the drug uh, is uh, Solriamfetol. Uh, Solriamfetol uh, was tested in a study at Mass General Hospital using about 60 adults with ADHD. This study was conducted by my friend Craig Sorman, who runs the Center for Adult ADHD up there at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Med School. Uh, and the article was published online in the Journal of clinical psychiatry, guess what, just yesterday. So it's a significant paper for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's a very well done study, which I would expect from Dr. Sermon and his colleagues, using double blind placebo controls uh, and looking at this existing drug for repurposing it over for management of adult ADHD. So uh, very well done study, a good sample size for a drug study uh, and used to placebo. Uh, also, what I liked about this particular drug is that it doesn't just hit one neurotransmitter, but it hits two that are implicated in ADHD and which are affected by the other ADHD drugs, and that is uh, dopamine and norepinephrine. The drug is a reuptake inhibitor, which means that it blocks the reuptake mechanism to some extent, allowing more of these two neurotransmitters to remain within the synapse, which is the gap between the nerve cells, so that these neurotransmitters can have a better chance of doing their job firing the nerve cells that are adjacent to them. So what's kind of neat about this is that here's a drug that actually hits two of the neurotransmitters, whereas the other drugs primarily uh, are affecting only one. So uh, it kind of gives you more bang for the buck if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and what they found is that the drug was not only well tolerated, uh, but that it did have a significant benefit for these adults with ADHD, with uh, about 45% or so of them showing a good, strong, positive clinical response. Uh, and there was a significant increase in control of ADHD symptoms. Uh, that is a decrease in the symptoms, if you want to refer to it that way, uh, as well as an improvement uh, in measures of executive functioning. Uh, also noteworthy is that this drug had somewhat less of an effect on measures of cardiac functioning, such as heart rate, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and so forth. Uh, measures that usually are increased somewhat by stimulant medication uh, were not affected by this medication. However, the drug did have some side effects that are relatively typical of this class of medications, that is dopamine or norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, kind of like methylphenidate, atomoxetine, uh, and so on, in that there were some gastrointestinal uh, difficulties, there was some insomnia, uh, some people reported headache and decreased appetite. Those are very common side effects for not only the stimulants, but to a lesser extent, to the non-stimulant medications. So uh, I just thought you might want to be aware of this because this drug is already available and being used for another purpose. And it wouldn't take much to repurpose it over for adult ADHD if this 
pilot study can be replicated by other researchers. Uh, in the meantime, there's no reason that the drug can't be used off-label by physicians who wish to use it that way for management of adult ADHD where the other ADHD drugs just haven't been especially beneficial. So it's not a first-line drug, at least not at this time, for management of adult ADHD, but yet another option that might be useful for helping adults with ADHD if they're not responding to the other better established, better investigated medications that are out there. So I just thought you might want to be aware of it. So there's another new development in our research, particularly for management of ADHD. Next up is a study that has to do with chemicals that are often found in plastics in our environment and their relationship to uh, ADHD and to autism spectrum disorder. Uh, this study was published in the journal PLUS ONE, uh, but I think it's better if you go have a look at the summary of it that was published over at New Atlas uh, by uh, uh, B. Thompson, and that is a study entitled More Evidence Connecting BPA Exposure to ADHD and Autism. This is a little bit more digestible for a lay audience than is the original publication here at PLUS ONE. But this is a study that was comparing uh, three groups. There were 66 children with autism spectrum disorder, 46 with ADHD, and a group of 37 controlled children. And the long and the short of it is that they were able to demonstrate that kids with ADHD and kids with autism had higher levels of these chemicals in their body. That is that their liver was not able to detoxify these compounds as well as in the control children, leaving them with somewhat greater levels of BPA uh, in their body. Um, and that is about 11% higher in kids with autism, about 17% higher rate in ADHD kids relative to the controls. So uh, what does all this mean? Well, a, a knee-jerk interpretation is that these chemicals are causing autism and ADHD uh, in a small set of children. But, you know, let's remember, this is a correlational study, and correlations cannot be used to infer cause. It is just as likely that ADHD and autism convey difficulties through the liver and elsewhere with detoxifying certain chemicals, in this case BPA, uh, in the environment. So, the issue isn't that BPA is causing these neurodevelopmental disorders, but that neurodevelopmental disorders might be associated with problems with breaking down and eliminating these compounds from the body. You could interpret the study either way. Uh, and so at this point, rather than rush to judgment, let's just say that this isn't the only study that has found a link between BPA levels and these two neurodevelopmental disorders. It's just one more study, a recent study that shows that. Uh, but let's be careful about interpreting causation from a correlational study. Uh, the last paper up here uh, is on the association of ADHD with gaming disorder. Now, I've talked about this previously in other research reviews. Uh, on this channel, but in this case, I want to focus on this study because it's a meta-analysis. And you know how much I love these meta-analyses because they go out and they collect all of the available studies that could be found in uh, searches of the scientific literature and then group the studies together to look for uh, robust findings. And because they're using so many studies and uh, such a large sample of individuals, the findings are usually much more robust and indicative of a finding of evidence for a relationship. So here's a meta-analysis published in Clinical Psychology Review just a couple weeks ago. Uh, and it found in its review of all available research what we had seen in earlier individual studies. And that is that there is a significant moderate association between ADHD and developing a gaming disorder. We already saw that internet addiction was more common in ADHD individuals, about 20 to 25% or more 
of young adults and even older teens with ADHD are prone to that kind of internet addiction. But this one looks specifically at gaming disorder within that larger category of addiction to the internet. And as with earlier studies, uh, this meta-analysis uh, affirms this particular linkage. And it found that both dimensions of ADHD symptoms, both inattention and hyperactive impulsive behavior, were independently linked to an elevated risk for gaming disorder. So uh, I think that this is uh, yet more, uh, if you will, icing on the cake or more evidence that there is a risk for this kind of addiction in ADHD, which fits with what we know about ADHD. ADHD makes people more prone to all kinds of addictive behaviors from substance abuse uh, to, uh, in this case, internet addiction to gaming addiction and so on. So there's something about the impulsivity, inattention and executive functioning deficits in ADHD that is predisposing people toward addictive types of behavior. So uh, there you are. That's it for the week. Have a look at the thumbnail sketch for all the other research that was published that I didn't happen to cover in this video. Uh, again, if you like this content, please recommend us to others who might be interested in ADHD. Uh, and again, if you're not a subscriber, uh, I encourage you to subscribe and stay up to date with ADHD research, as well as my weekly commentaries on special topics here on my YouTube channel. And by the way, if you're not familiar with it, go over and have a look at my website where you'll find lots of free information, fact sheets, uh, a list of my current books, uh, as well as uh, other information about me over at russellbarkley.org. So thanks for joining me today for this research update. Hope to see you again on this channel in the future. Be well, everybody.